So today, uh, she sent me an email and asked me if I would record it. So I assume we'll she's going to watch it. She'll okay. watch it. Yeah. Why? Because she wants to make an A. She wants to keep an A. And some of us, you know, are entitled. And some of us are just want to be average. Just want to get by. Some of us want to excel. Some of us want to be held accountable. Some of us don't. It's the human condition. Yes? Right? So I want to be good at my job. So I'm going to teach you about Congress because I think it's important. So quick review of some of the things we've talked about. We talked about the qualifications for the House and the Senate, uh, how much money they make, that sort of thing, the benefits that they have. Remember, you got to be 25, be in the House, seven years a citizen, okay, live in the district that you represent. And in the Senate, you got to be 30, okay, and live in the state that you represent in nine years a citizen. Okay, and then yesterday, uh, Friday, I went over with you guys like the average member of Congress. And the 118th Congress uh, is the most diverse Congress we've ever had, yes. Okay, as the country becomes more diverse, Congress will reflect that. Uh, more women are running for office, so more women are winning and getting elected to office, to Congress, and so forth. Okay, so. Today, we're going to talk about powers of Congress, and some of the powers that Congress had, you already know. Like, they control the purse. You know, they make the laws. Well, there's this thing called express powers that some of you, a couple of you, got right on the test. So things that are specifically written in the Constitution are expressed, like in Article 1, Section 8, where it says Congress is empowered to do the following. And among those listed in the Constitution, some are listed here. They have the power to print money. States don't. Only Congress can. Okay? They have the power to pass laws that regulate trade between the United States and other countries and trade between the states. The Interstate Commerce Clause, which is found in Article 1 of the Constitution. They have the power to raise an army a Navy, an Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Space Force, Armed Services, okay, to provide and maintain for military forces, <coughs> law enforcement. Now, the Constitution only mentions the Supreme Court, but it says Congress will create all courts beneath it, which they have done, federal appeals courts and federal district courts. Which are all created by Congress. And then the ability to govern the District of Columbia and to allow for new states, which takes an enabling act to have them write a constitution and then an act of admission to admit them into the union, which like three people got right on the test. Stumped. Now, guys, the highest elected official in the local government of Washington, D.C. is the... Who's the highest elected official? D.C. is a city. Who's the highest elected official in Wichita? Wichita. Yeah. The mayor. Lily. Who? Okay. Now, do we have a city council? So does the District of Columbia. Do we have a school board in Wichita? Yep, so does the District of Columbia. Now, if the Congress doesn't think the mayor, the school board, and the city council is doing a good job running the District of Columbia, the Congress can take over running the local government themselves, those 535 members of Congress. Now, do you think President Obama 
sent his two daughters to public schools in Washington, D.C.? Oh, heck no. What about Jimmy Carter? His daughter? Amy? No. The Bush's daughters? Well, they were in college by the time he was president. No. The Kennedys? Did they send their kids to uh, public schools in Washington, D.C.? No. They're among the worst public schools in the country, in our nation's capital. In the 1990s, guys, the U.S. Congress actually took over running the public schools in Washington, D.C. Because they were so bad. And they have the authority to do that in the Constitution. Okay? So we're looking at powers of Congress. All right? What can they do? Okay? So this is the Pentagon. Okay? Five sites. Okay? It's where the Department of Defense is. So that's where the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and so forth are headquartered here in the Pentagon. Congress created the money to build that. Now, these two bodies, the House and the Senate, have some special powers that we want to talk about today that are unique to each house, and some they share. But mostly we're focused on things that are unique to them. One of those things is impeachment. Now, everybody's heard of impeachment, yeah? Especially in recent years, we just had a president impeached twice. Yes? Now, one of your key terms for your key terms for chapter five, which I have great, haven't put them in yet, is impeachment. Trouble here. Over here. Impeachment. Now, to impeach, here you go. All it simply means is to formally accuse. You ever heard of an, an indictment? Somebody's been indicted, like President Trump's facing a bunch of indictments right now, yes? Does it mean he's guilty? No, it just means he's been charged, okay? That's all impeachment. We've had three presidents impeached, which means they were charged with what? What? Committed, of, charged with committing serious crimes against the nation. Or, as the Constitution writes it, high crimes and misdemeanors. Is a speeding ticket a misdemeanor? Yeah, jaywalking? Misdemeanor. Impeach the president for that. We gonna impeach the vice president for that? We gonna impeach federal judges for that? No. Okay. So it needs to be a serious crime. Now, as I said, this has happened three times. It's happened to President Andrew Johnson, who was Lincoln's vice president, who took over when Lincoln was assassinated and was impeached, but not removed, not found guilty. William Jefferson Clinton was impeached, but not found guilty. And Donald Trump was impeached twice and not found guilty. Twice. Now, that means there's got to be a trial. Yes? March. You know where they hold the trials? Not in the House, but in the Senate. In the Senate. Okay. So, if you impeach William Jefferson Clinton, you know what he's impeached over? Is it a serious crime against the nation to have an affair? have sexual relationship with somebody that's not your spouse? Is that a crime, a serious crime against the nation? No. In fact, it's not even a crime. Well, let's talk about it. President Clinton was notorious from his time as governor 
People knew. Women came out of the woodwork when he ran for president. Of course, Jennifer Flowers said, I had an affair with Donald, or Donald Trump, with Bill Clinton for 11 years. Another woman named Paula Jones sued President Clinton for sexual harassment. She worked for the state of Arkansas. He was the governor. He was her boss. And Bill Clinton went to a convention in Little Rock, in the Capitol, and Paula Jones was working the front desk at the convention. She worked for the state of Arkansas. Bill Clinton saw her. They locked eyes. Bill Clinton went up to his hotel room at the convention center and had one of his minions go down and ask Paula Jones to go up to his hotel room where he proceeded to drop his pants and asked her to. Now, she works for him. That's her boss. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a perfect example of sexual harassment. You don't do that with your employees. Yes? Now, she was suing Governor Clinton, who ran for president. Well, that case drug on after he was elected president. He was put under oath in front of a federal judge and asked about Paula Jones and this incident. Mark, Troilo, the lawyer for Paula Jones, who was accusing him of sexual harassment, learned of an affair that President Clinton was having at the White House with an intern named Monica Lewinsky. This was a consensual relationship. She was an adult. She was in her 20s. She found the president attractive. He found her attractive. Now, Bill Clinton was asked under oath if he had a relationship with Monica Lewinsky, another one of his employees. He lied under oath in front of a federal judge. This is called what? Perjury. Felony. Now, are we going to impeach the President of the United States over lying about sex? Because what man who has not has had an affair didn't want to lie about? It? What woman has had an affair didn't want to lie about? It? Now, at the time, I didn't vote for Bill Clinton. I didn't like Bill Clinton, and I'm like, impeach his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, thirty years. Yeah. Some distance there, you know what I mean? You like now. Another impeachment charge was he got people that worked for him at the White House to go out and lie for him, which is telling your employees to obstruct the truth or obstruct justice. Obstruction of justice was another charge. So this was sent to a trial. Leah? What? What's my name? <laughs> Not Leah. I got your attention. Ms. <laughs> Marsh, the jury is 100. For the jury. Who? 100 senators. Now, who's the judge? If you're in a trial, you gotta have a judge. Now, the president or vice president is being impeached. The Supreme Court Chief Justice is the judge. So you bring him over from the Supreme Court. You got 100 jury. The prosecution are members of the House of Representatives that are bringing the charges against the president, and then the president has his own lawyers. Now, if a federal judge is being impeached, the vice president sits as the judge, if that makes sense, okay? So, 
What do you need to convict? In a criminal trial, it's got to be 12-0, unanimous. Not an 11-1, 12-0. Here, it's got to be two-thirds to convict. So neither Andrew Johnson, William Jefferson Clinton, or Donald Trump were convicted with two-thirds. Okay? Now, the Donald Trump impeachment, one dealt with this Russian collusion stuff during the election, which was pretty much proven by a special counsel that nothing really happened there. The second one was over a phone call that President Trump made with the president of Ukraine. Now, obviously, guys, this is before the war started. This is before Ukraine was invaded by Russia. We had been giving aid to Ukraine for years. Oh, we do a little bit of that around the world, you know? A little bit of foreign aid, okay? And we knew that Ukraine was kind of under threat of the Russians. So we were giving them help, money, lots of money. Obama gave them money. Trump got into office. Congress approved billions of dollars to go to the Ukraine. But before Trump was going to release that money to the Ukraine, he called the president of Ukraine, which was not Zelensky at the time. It was a different president of Ukraine. And guys, if you go back to 2016 and look up the list of most corrupt nations on the planet, in the top five, you're going to find Ukraine, a very corrupt government. So President Trump, and this phone call is recorded. We have the transcript. President Trump said he wanted the president of Ukraine to look into the corruption that was going on in Ukraine before he released this money, this aid. What President Trump was wanting to find out was what the heck were the Bidens up to while Joe Biden was vice president in the Ukraine? Because his son, Hunter, was placed on the board of a large energy company in the Ukraine called Burisma. Hunter Biden has no experience in the energy world. In fact, at the time, Hunter Biden was a crack act. He has no experience for this, and the Ukrainian energy company was paying him hundreds of thousands of dollars. And Hunter also had some deals with the Chinese, while his daddy was vice president. Okay. So the Republicans right now are looking into whether Joe Biden had anything to do with that and whether Joe Biden benefited from it and whether he changed American policies to benefit China and or Ukraine so that his son could get all this money, which has been shared with the rest of the Biden family. Millions, tens of millions of dollars. So Trump asked the president of Ukraine to look into this corruption. Now, Joe Biden wasn't running for president when this phone call took place. Okay? Didn't know he was going to run for president, let alone get elected in 2020. So they impeached Trump for withholding this foreign aid to investigate his political opponent. That impeachment actually took place after the election had finished. So the chief justice of the Supreme Court didn't even show up for that trial. He's like, Trump's leaving office. This impeachment doesn't mean anything. Guys, these impeachments are political processes. If you are convicted in the Senate, you don't go to jail. You just have to leave the White House. Nobody's going to jail. This is not a criminal trial. It's a political trial. Okay. Do the Republicans have enough dirt on the Biden family and Joe Biden to impeach him right now? 
Probably not. Is Joe Biden corrupt? I'll let you decide. You got to dig into that. Okay, but at politically, with about 200 days before the presidential election, I don't know if it's a wise move for the Republicans to even try to impeach him, unless they had a smoking gun. Like they had all the evidence and they wanted the American people to see it. That Joe Biden changed American foreign policy to benefit his family, taking mil- tens of millions of dollars. If they could like make all the connections and prove it where people could understand it. Our people have an attention span of about five minutes, so you're going to have to wrap that up into a nice bow for people to understand, which is hard to do when you're talking about money laundering, okay, moving it through shell companies and all this sort of stuff, okay? It's hard to prove, okay, and it's hard to win that argument politically. So I don't think the Republicans will impeach it, okay, in the last 200 days. I don't think politically it's going to benefit the Republicans, and they're not going to do it unless it benefits them politically, okay? Because it's a political thing, all right? So, vice president is usually acting judge unless the president's on trial. President's on trial, it's chief justice, okay? Two-thirds to convict. Good? Okay. We've never had, never... I don't think we've had a vice president impeached. We have had federal judges impeached. Okay, other special power. Now this, we're focusing on the Senate, okay? Ratifying treaties. Now, we probably talked about this. The president can put together a treaty with a bunch of other nations. But it's got to be approved by the Senate. So remember the uh, League of Nations after World War I? Woodrow Wilson, it was his idea, our president's idea, to do this League of Nations. And the Senate would not approve it. So we didn't join the League of Nations. The League of Nations happened, but we didn't join. Because the Senate would not approve it. Two-thirds or 67 votes. Okay. It's hard to do that. Now, you guys remember NATO after World War II. The Senate approved that by two-thirds. You don't do a lot of treaties. They make them difficult to do. The founders of this country said, listen, entangling alliances gets you drawn into wars. So you might see more along the lines of economic treaties. Like, where we get together with other nations and say, okay, we're going to have some trade agreements. It'll be a treaty. Now, the president can do what's called an executive agreement, which is just between the president and one other president. That's allowed. Doesn't require Senate approval. Okay? And then this one I think we've talked about as well. The president gets to appoint certain types of people in the government. So whether it be... um, Federal judges, right? Supreme Court justices, president gets the point. His cabinet, ambassadors, the head of the IRS is appointed by the president, the head of the CIA is appointed by the president, the head of the FBI is appointed by the president, okay? Different agencies. Some agencies, it's a civil, a civil service job where you get the job and you keep it until you retire or you get fired, okay? Uh, like the head of the post office, okay? That's not appointed by the president. The head of the Federal Trade Commission or the Federal Aviation Administration, not generally appointed by the president, okay? But cabinet positions are. Now, generally, guys, when you get a new president, the president says, these are the people I want in my cabinet. The Senate usually allows them. And all it takes is a majority vote, 51 votes in the Senate, to allow that. Now, who cares who the Secretary of Transportation is? I don't, I don't it's not that, I don't, maybe it's not that important. Who's the Secretary of Education? I don't know. I don't care. It does matter who the Secretary of Defense is. 
doesn't matter who the Secretary of State is. And the one that gets most politically divisive is the Attorney General, the head of the Department of Justice. Because the head of the, the Attorney General is the chief law enforcement officer of the country. So, are we enforcing the laws in this country when it comes to marijuana? Marijuana is a federally banned substance. Federal law says you're not allowed to grow it, you're not allowed to sell it, you're not allowed to smoke it. Period. Who's enforcing the law? Well, if you get pulled over by the Mays Police Department for having marijuana, they might enforce the law. If you get pulled over by the Wichita Police Department with a small amount of marijuana, they're going to take you to jail? They're not. They've told us. They're not. They're not going to deal with that. It's seen as a petty crime. They're not enforcing the law. But the Department of Justice, the Attorney General right now, could shut down every pot shop in America legally. It's federal law, which trumps Colorado's laws, trumps Oregon's law. They could do it. You could send in the DEA, the ATF, U.S. Marshals, and shut down every pot shop in America right now. But they don't. So, are we enforcing our laws at the border? Not really. Whose job is that? It's the Attorney General's job. What's his name? Merrick Garland. So Republicans and Democrats are going to fight over that one. They're going to fight over these judges because they serve for life. These judges, they change culture. But most of the cabinet members, they don't really care. Ambassador, does it matter? You guys know that we have an embassy in every country that we have relations with. And therefore, an ambassador that's the head of that embassy. Does it really matter who the ambassador to Luxembourg is? So the president's going to give that job to a friend, to a campaign donor. He says, hey, how would you and your family like to move to Luxembourg for the next four years and be treated like royalty? Everything's paid for. Your housing, your food, everything's paid for. Sounds like a nice gig for four years. An adventure. Yes? Does it matter who the ambassador to China is? Or Russia? Yeah. So you're going to want to appoint somebody that's qualified for that. Guys, a lot of countries around the world, they go to political donors. I remember when Bill Clinton, this was kind of controversial. You guys have all heard of Tyson Foods, Tyson Chicken. Yes? Which I am boycotting. They just shut down one of their factories in Iowa and laid off 1,200 people. They're going to move it and they're going to hire migrant labor and pay them less than those. 1,200 people basically destroying that small town's economy. 1,200 people in that small town no longer have jobs. So I bought chicken Friday night on my way home, Saturday night on my way home to Dillon's, and I got chicken that wasn't from Tyson. And it said cage-free chicken. That means they let them roam, but not in some huge processing plant. <laughs> Was the chicken good? Yeah. My okay. wife made bang bang chicken. Oh, that's good. Bye bye. An air fryer. How many guys have an air fryer? Oh, that's good. 
It's the greatest. That's the greatest. That's the greatest. That's great, right? Especially like potatoes. You make your own French fry. Do potatoes, chop them up, put them in some olive oil, put some rosemary, some herbs. herbs, yeah. Garlic, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's the best. Way better than the microwave. Now, you guys know I've been eating a lot of fish. I think microwaving, warming up fish is better than air fryer. Well, crispy fish is not, unless you're eating fried. Yeah, but it's microwave, it makes it taste like really Yeah, but you're talking like 25 seconds. It smells. Yeah. I got in trouble down to the factory lounge a few weeks ago. Brought some leftover cod. The whole freaking office smelled like fish. That is awesome. They were all over me. Who brought the fish? You don't even have to. You don't have to burn it. You just gotta cook it. I mean, don't burn. Don't burn. Burning's bad. Okay. Now. Now. If you're ever stuck in another country and you need to find help as an American, you can try and get to the embassy and they will try and help you. The other place you can go in those countries is called a consulate. The consulate deals with things like visas and travel between countries. Okay. Sometimes, the, most of the time, the consulate and the embassy are in two different cities in that country. Okay? So if you're traveling internationally, you should know where the consulate is, the U.S. consulate. And the president gets to appoint those consuls, okay, as well. Yeah? Where's the consulate in Mexico? I don't know. What's that? Where's the American consulate in Mexico? It may be in Mexico City. U.S. Consulate in Mexico. Location. It says Brownsville, Texas. That might be that's that might be where the Mexican consulate is in the United States. <laughs> yeah, try to get into Mexico illegally. You want to go to a Mexican jail? Rodriguez. I'm good. Do these gringos want to go to a Mexican jail? That's <laughs> 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 okay, this, guys, this picture up here, President Bush, surrounded by Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State. This is a cabinet meeting. Now, I remember when you were kids and you learned about the cabinet. These are the people that advise the president, correct? Wrong. These are the people that run the departments. This is Rick. The president doesn't bring the cabinet together and say, okay, guys, let's come up with a plan how we're going to run the country. That's not how it works. Okay? The president has advisors. Now, if he needs advice about transportation, he can talk to the transportation secretary. But Pete Buttigieg is the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana. That's what qualified him to be the Department of Transportation. He's never run. Amtrak. He's never run an airport authority or a port authority on that coast. He's never done any of that. He's the mayor of a small town in Indiana. <laughs> it's a political appointment. Pete Buttigieg doesn't know anything more about transportation than I do. He probably does now. He's been transportation secretary for three and a half years. So now he does. Okay. But was he the most qualified person for the job? 
No. The president's not going to ask him for advice. He's going to ask an expert. Okay? And the decisions that presidents make, oftentimes, guys, are political ones. So he's surrounded by political advisors. Who's running the country right now? You got to look at Joe Biden's inner circle, which includes the first lady. Kamala and Joe are not very close. Okay. Most vice presidents and presidents aren't very close. Okay. Vice presidents don't do that much. I mean, Joe, Joe Biden threw Kamala under the bus, dude. He put her in charge of the border. That he's in charge. Of. She has no authority. And when the border is really bad, they look. People look at her and say, "Aren't you in charge of the border?" She has no authority. She's the vice president. She has no constitutional power other than to break a tie vote in the Senate and be there in case the president dies. She has no power. Why would he do that? That was that was bad. That he put her in charge of the board. It's not totally unfair to her. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Orange. Yeah. How many members of the house? 435. Okay. We're talking about elections here. Rodriguez, how many members of the Senate? Two from each state. Michael Frank, the 23rd Amendment to the Constitution gave Washington, D.C. free what? Electoral college vote. <laughs> How many electoral college votes are there? Total. 538. You have to win a majority of them to win the presidency. Not the most. A majority. 51%. So you divide this in half. 269. That's half. That's not a majority. 270 is a majority. If no candidate receives 270 electoral college votes, the House of Representatives will elect the president. This has happened twice in American history. 1801 with Thomas Jefferson and 1825 with John Quincy Adams. John Adams' son. Okay? This is how it works. Now, we got 435 members of the House. This is not, they don't just take a vote. It works like this. Now, Kansas has four members of the House, right? Mann, Tracy Mann, Ron Estes, Jake LaTurner, and Sharice Davis. Correct? Three of them are Republicans. One is a Democrat. Here. Grenade. So, one vote for Kansas, three to one Republican. So it's a Trump between, it's a tie between Trump and Biden. Now, if you mix the numbers up enough, can you get to a 269 to 269 tie? Yes. If you have a third party candidate that actually wins some electoral college votes, this could be more common. Let's say you had a strong third party, call it the Independent Party or the Green Party or the Libertarian, and they do well and they win some electoral. Like in 1964, where you had a splinter party where George Wallace, who was a segregationist, broke away from the Democratic Party and won four Southern states winning 46 electoral college votes. 
That could prevent one of the other two candidates from getting to 270. Following me. So either a tie or nobody gets to 270. California, how many members of the House does California have? 52, right? Subtract two. Okay. Do you think more of those are Democrats or Republicans? Okay. One vote. California for Biden. North Dakota. They have one member of the House. Republican or Democrat? Republican. One vote. North Carolina, or I say North Dakota. Trump. And so on and so on. How many states do you have to win? 26. That's how these two were elected. Okay? Could it happen again? Let's sum it out. Yes. What if it's a tie 25-25? Ooh. Now I've been teaching this for 25 years, so you know I've had that question before. And I'm prepared for it. If there's a tie in the House, the outgoing vice president will become president until they break the tie. So in this case, Trump and Biden tie, 25-25 tie in the House. Kamala Harris becomes president until they break the tie. Now, good thing for Trump, Republicans are going to win that vote right now in the House. Republicans have more states with more seats, you know, with more House seats than Democrats, because there's a bunch of Democrats in California. Okay. Texas is pretty split. New York's pretty split, but would go to the Democrats. A lot of these states, most of them have more Republican representatives than Democrats because of California. Okay. Now, you guys, let me pick on somebody else. Zoe, do you remember the 12th Amendment? No? Yeah. Okay, remember, it used to guide the person that finished first was president, the person that finished second was vice president. What if there was a tie for second? Then the Senate choose who the vice president was. They write about this in the Constitution. Because of the 12th Amendment, that will never happen again. It happened one time. Where the Senate had to choose who the vice president was. There was a tie for second. So this tells you the 12th Amendment was passed post-1837. In the 13th Amendment, it was 1866 as was the 14th and 15th, 1866, okay? So the 12th Amendment fell in here, and they said, you know what? We need to put the president and the vice president on the same ticket and get, get rid of this nonsense, okay? So they did. They fixed it. Founding fathers were not perfect. They didn't get it all right, okay? Got a lot of it right, but adjustments had to be made. Now, guys, we are stuck with the Electoral College. The Electoral College is in the Constitution. Now, you remember how hard it is to pass a Constitution amendment. You've got to get two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the states to agree to this. I'm telling you right now, those states with less than 16 Electoral College votes, there's no way in heck they're voting to overturn the Electoral College because that would strip those states of their power. North Dakota, Kansas, South Dakota, Hawaii, they're not going to give up their power. Under the Constitution, states have power. Because remember, all the fighting about confederalism versus federalism, right? Like states were worried about losing power. So in the Constitution, they retain some of that power through things like the Electoral College. They're not going to give it up. 
So we're stuck with this, guys. It's not going anywhere. We're not going to have a popular vote in the United States for president. As much as some people may want it, it's not going to happen. Okay? Now, if you were asking my personal opinion, <coughs> should we do away with the Electoral College? <coughs> Excuse me. My answer would be no. I live in a small state. Kansas has a say. Our six electoral college votes matter. We did a popular vote. We just count all the votes in the country, and that's the winner. The presidents care what people thought in Kansas. The candidates care what people in Kansas thought. They worry about the people where the people live. Okay, on the East Coast, on the West Coast, Great Lakes, Gulf of Mexico. More than 50% of our population resides within 50 miles of one of those bodies of water. More than 50%. That's where you're going to go for votes. Not out here in the boondocks. Okay. All right. Now, this is dated. This is the 116th. We're in the 118th Congress now. Each of these parties have leaders. When they hold a new Congress in January, so the elections are in November. Remember, the president takes office January 20th. Congress takes office on January 3rd. They elect these people to be their leaders. Now, this one still has Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House. Mike Johnson is the Speaker of the House today. Okay. The Senate Majority Leader is Chuck Schumer. He was the Minority Leader. He's a switch. Mitch McConnell is now the Minority Leader. Democrats control the Senate, Republicans control the House. The Senate President Pro Tempore is the longest serving member of the majority party in the Senate. That today is a woman named Patty Murray of Washington State. She has been in the Senate longer than any other Democrat. She is fourth in line to be president. Okay. Chuck Grassley, Republican from Ohio, used to be when the Republicans control the Senate, but they don't control it anymore. Democrats do. So now that's a Democrat. So if Biden, Harris, and Mike Johnson, who's the Speaker of the House Republican, if they were all to die right now, Patty Murray would become President of the United States. Okay. If Joe Biden died right now, Kamala Harris would be President. If Biden and Harris died, Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House, would be President. Does that make sense? If the first four die, then the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, becomes President of the United States. If he dies at the same time, the Secretary of Treasury becomes Janet Yellen. If she dies two of the same day, then it goes to the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. And down the line of the cabinet in the order they were created. Homeland Security being last. If all of them died, well, we're in trouble. And I don't know what would happen. Yeah. That's right. The designated survivor. Yep. Survivor. So when they have the State of the Union address, and the President, the Vice President, the Speaker of the House are all within 15 feet of each other. And a lot of the cabinet members are at the State of the Union address. The Senate's there. The House is there. Patty Murray's there. The bomb goes off. One of the cabinet members stays home under guard so that they can be the designated survivor and will become president if everybody dies. And there's a TV show on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, we'll learn more about these leadership positions as we go on, okay? And that is where I finished in the other class. That's where we go.